passes that the USA will be making here, passing with three. Interesting little um, look here where, uh, of course, you have uh, Rich Lamborn, Riley Salmon, and Reed Pretty, the main three passers for the USA system, again, following the principle of exposing your best at any given skill. And sometimes in the next few clips here, we'll see an interesting uh, shot where Reed is trying to give him one look and then jumps back to more closely to where he expects the ball to go. So he's standing there and then moves out of the way. That's all something that the passers have talked about beforehand. And even on this one, Reed starts way over by the sideline, and maybe he's just trying to see the server. You got a little bit of a screen going there, too. And then jumps back into position. And um, the interesting thing to note on this next one is, this is one of the harder servers uh, for the Russians, is just to give the server a little different look, the opposite here, Clay Stanley, uh, jumps into the formation, which he did often when he was in right front over here in rotation three with the center and left back. And when he's in right back, it's a pretty convenient spot to do. But one, one of the things it does is it just gives the server a little less seams to hit. It gives the server a different look. They did this often, but Hugh laughs because Clay passed a total of one serve in the whole quad. Servers could never get it over to him, but he took up just enough space to chain things up, change things up a little and get the servers just a little out of their comfort zone, especially if their tactic was to maybe hit the front row offensive player, or maybe, as uh, is becoming more prevalent, maybe you hit the backcourt offensive player, because if you pull Reed Pretty up a little closer to the net, now he's not going to be as effective of a big hitter, and now we reduced it down to three hitters against three blockers. <coughs> so again, if there's less space and they can pinch a little, it makes the, uh, the job for the server that much harder. And there he's trying to hit a seam and hits it into the net. Okay. Uh, some things that we talk about in responsibilities when we're using, and of course, you all have to make the decision. Am I going to pass with the, uh, the, the W or the smile 5 or the 4 or the 3 or the 2? Who knows what it will come to, but the standard three-passer system that we use in our gym anyway, we have some designated responsibilities. And um, this is, these are the responsibilities we normally delegate when the server is in zone one here, or the server is in zone six, is because generally our, path, our setter is standing over here, and these players have to take the ball from their left and get it to their right. It's a little easier for them to reach left. So a ball that's in the exact seam here um, will be taken by the player who gets to reach left. It's a little easier of an angle to make to reach left and then take the ball to the right here. Some of you might have heard the cute term that left is right and right is wrong. Um, I try not to use that in our gym, even though I'm talking about it, that if somebody is in a direct seam here, then we, we prefer a player reaching left from these two serving zones. The reason I don't say something is wrong in our gym, and don't advise you to either, is just because <laughs> if you say something's wrong, are people going to do it? No. I think Nev's seen that a few times where players have been told, okay, right is wrong. So the ball is one foot over here, and I let it go because that's the wrong thing to do, to reach to my right. And that's violating the principle of keeping the ball in the air. That's what you do in a volleyball game. So we, uh, we want to be good in lots of different places as passers. We want to be able to take a ball out here. We want to take a ball out here. But in this case, and I'll get to your question in a minute, the exact seam 
in a situation where all three of these passers are equal, that exact seam this player is going to take and reach left to make that pass. Now, it might change because if we have Stacy Sikora, who's a, who's a very strong Libero, and Logan Tom in these two spots, maybe they're taking 40%, 40%, and maybe our other front row outsides taking 20%. So maybe they change the seams at that point. But with, this is a starting point, and they work from that. Question. Yeah, I was just going to say, would you ch like if you had the libero in the middle, would you change them to take maybe both seams or also if we'll do that for sure. If, uh, if the if the bro if the libero is in the middle, maybe that bro will take both seams. It depends on all kinds of things, and it depends on the server and the history of the server right. and where that server likes to serve. Uh, also, if the server was so you have the server on that side. If the server switched sides, would you then say seam like that? Yeah, uh, seam right. There we go. So we actually change our base, our fundamental responsibilities. And again, I talked about it up front. Just because I say something doesn't mean it's right uh, only because I said it or only because we do it. It has to follow your principles, and this is what we do. And if it makes sense, maybe it's something you embrace too. But I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm telling you what we do and why it makes sense. Now, when the server is over here in five, we change our base responsibility, all things being exactly equal. And that is because now this player, it's actually easier, especially for this player, and servers often go down this line, to reach a little right to make an angle to go to, to put the ball on the spot of where our setter ideally would like to take it. Uh, and, but again, those can change based on where the libero is. Maybe if the libero is here, she's taking this seam and this seam, or he, depending on what team you're talking about. But this is what we work from to start, and then you can adjust accordingly. And, you know, again, that's exposing our three best, who are clearly better than the other two on the court. Obviously, uh, the the middle and the opposite would be the other two that we'd be worried about. So what is state of the art in the future? I have no idea. It could be one person serve receive if you really got somebody good. Who knows? Might be fun to see that sometime. I've never seen it indoors. I've seen it on the beach, but not indoors. And uh, it's worked all right, but that's only uh, when somebody's cramping and that's what you're left with, or somebody's hurt. Um, so, in my opinion, uh, being a great re a team that receives serve well takes three things. It takes a pretty decent system. We've already talked about that. Whether you're going to use two or three or four or five or one or zero is all you need if you're playing against USC and they're serving out 22 times. <laughs> um, you also need players who are pretty good mechanically at this skill. But I think the one thing uh, that you also need is the ability to see and read the game. A critical skill. And I think the best passers in the world see the right things off the server's hand and the hand in relation to the ball much more clearly and quickly than the average passer. We have some passers in our gym, high-level college players who... At least when they first got there, one of them told me, you know, Karts, I don't have a sense of what the ball is doing or where it's going until it's crossing the net. That's a tough way to make a living as a passer if I have no idea what's happening until the ball is crossing the net. I've got to have, I think, 70, 75, 80 percent of my work done by the time the ball gets to the net. And the only way I'm going to do that is by seeing the right things. That's the critical third component, is reading, seeing the game. Right. So I, we call it, in our gym anyway, the premier skill in the game. And uh, another way of defining reading, in my mind, is seeing and recognizing patterns. It could be a pattern of a hitter dropping a shoulder. If I'm hitting against all of you, and I'm hitting over on my right sideline, hitting a back set of some sort, a five, a red, a D, and I drop my shoulder, that's a pattern. What does that tell you 
about where the ball might go. Am I more likely to hit it cross court or am I more likely to hit it down the line? I hear a line, a line, a line. Exactly. Many hitters are greatly patterned that the more they do this, the more the ball is going to go that way. That's a simple pattern that every player on the volleyball court should know well. That's a reading pattern. And in my mind, I felt that that was my com one of my competitive advantages, is that I had a very strong ability to read the game. Um, I call it my visual encyclopedia. It's like I have all these patterns in here that have come from years and years of playing volleyball. And as soon as I see the pattern, as I'm flipping through it, oh, there's that pattern, shoulder dropping. All of a sudden, that pattern tells me the probability is much greater that something's going to happen. It's not for sure, but every tenth of a second that goes by that I see increasing signs of this pattern gives me increasing odds that this play is going to happen, which gives me uh, an increasing ability to put myself in the right spot. Critical stuff for a volleyball player. Um, where, where did I... let's see. Okay, there was a, a kind of a meta-analysis that came out a few years ago that was interesting to me called Perceptual Expertise in Sport. They took a look at all these studies of elite athletes compared to non-elite athletes and how they perceive, how they see the game. And they came up first of all with some things that we think are happening with elite athletes that actually aren't. One of the things that does not happen is that generally speaking elite athletes don't have greatly superior visual systems. It's not like they've got 20-10 vision or just crazy uh, peripheral vision, those kinds of things. They see their eyes work not much better than the average athlete. Maybe on average about the same. They don't have an advantage there. Another myth is that some of these perceptual skills don't transfer across sports. Actually they do a little and so I think of it, uh, myself as having an advantage when I grew up. We see it less and less these days unfortunately but I played multiple sports. I played soccer and baseball and tennis and some swimming and so some of the patterns that I learned to see on the soccer field served, will serve me as I'm trying to see patterns with multiple athletes across the net on the volleyball court. Uh, and another myth is that these skills cannot be improved with practice or instruction. Actually they can. Of course everything we do on the volleyball court is learned so of course I can improve it. I can learn to be better. Some of the things that they did find are, uh, I guess the realities are that they recognize and recall experts do structured patterns. It was interesting to me because um, I guess uh, when I came into UCLA, uh, well I'll back up a second, so, so if you take a grandmaster chess competitor, chess player, and you show him or her a board and then take it away. If it's not two newbies playing where they have no clue what they're doing, but it's an actual two pretty good chess players, this grandmaster will mu have a much greater chance of being able to replicate all the positions on the board if you ask them to just after a quick flash because it's a pattern that they've seen before. The unstructured patterns, they're no better at than the non-elite. Uh, same with elite soccer players. If you show them a few seconds of a contest on film or live and then you freeze it and ask them to draw the players in the proper positions, they'll be much better than the non-elite athlete in doing that. So at UCLA, my freshman year, our tradition then, because UCLA was winning a whole lot then in men's volleyball, was that we would get together for a film session sometime during the first week of school to analyze what went wrong or what went right the previous season. The previous season, UCLA lost to Pepperdine in the fifth and final uh, set or game of the match in the NCAA finals. And so our coach, Al Skates, one of the all-time greats, said, okay boys, we're going to watch this match and we're going to learn from it and we're not going to let it happen this year. 
And so uh, there was a critical play at UCLA is winning 13-12 in the fifth game. And all the guys, I was a freshman, so I wasn't there, didn't get to see it, but all the guys who were there said, Karch, wait till you see this play. We got robbed. We got reamed. Uh, because at, at that time, you couldn't lift the ball like you can now and just throw it up any which way. <laughs> and so um, UCLA serves the ball. The Pepperdine outside hitter hits the ball. UCLA stuffs it. And somebody for Pepperdine is under there and gets the ball up in the air somehow. That's when the Bruins thought, we got robbed. That was clearly a lift. But what happened was, there's this bing bing play. Possible lift. It goes right to somebody else who hits it up. And there's another player over here who jumps and hits the ball down while the Bruins are still complaining about what happened on the first contact. So I said, did you guys, uh, I'm just a little freshman, but I piped up anyway, and I said, did you guys notice anything else weird about that play? And they said, no, there's a lift, and, you know, they put the ball down. And so I said, all right, play it back. They played it back. They still didn't notice. I said, did you notice who hit the ball? They said, oh, it was the setter. I said, did you know whether he was front row or back row? Turns out he was back row, but he was standing on the four-foot line, and that's something that you have to know. So there was a pattern that I saw, and immediately the winnable argument they had no idea had happened. That argument you will win every time. You'll never win the lift call argument. No referee's ever going to reverse that call once they've made it. One of our assistant coaches was so <laughs> livid he didn't talk for about four days after that that he didn't, <laughs> he didn't see that as it happened because they could have won that argument. Now they're up 14-12, and who knows? Maybe it's a title, maybe it's not, but they never got another point in that match. Recalling patterns. Um, with the elite athletes, of course, use advanced visual cues, and they look at the right things a lot. So if you have lots of players out there, the more beginner or average athlete is watching the ball a lot. I see that all the time in volleyball. <laughs> Players look to me uh, like they're watching the game through a pair of paper towel tubes. There's the ball and there's the ball and look at all this information I could be getting, all these patterns that I'm not getting at all because I have this super narrow focus and I'm watching the ball. Instead of elite athletes who see this and take quick looks here, and now I know I'm a blocker, and oh, my hitter's changing the pattern. I see that quickly, but I'm still looking at the setter, and I'm aware of all these different things, and much of it has nothing to do with looking at the ball. Of course, with fewer players, and I'm just now playing defense and looking at a hitter, the more beginning defenders are still looking at the ball, but I take my eyes, or, or elite athletes take their eyes off the ball and start getting cues, critical cues, things like shoulder drop, things like where are the hitter's hips, things like where is the ball in relation to the shoulder this way, where is the ball in relation to the shoulder this way. How, is, how high did my elbow get up? Those are all things that are actually learned skills that we need to figure out a way to help our athletes, help our volleyball players, help our teams get better at. Um, we uh, experts generally at least get enough information to make a pretty good decision. Even if the play is a bam, bam, quick play, they, of course, know the probabilities. That's what it's all about, is this pattern will tell me the probability. Another critical thing is that elite athletes, when things get really excited, it's a gold medal match, it's an NCAA title match, they are less affected by emotional state. Their perceptual skills stay strong. And that's another reason why we want to develop good perceptual skills for our athletes, is when it gets pressure filled, if they're better readers of the game, then they start from a higher baseline and they'll be better um, for your team in that big match. They also generally develop skills at an early age, earlier age. I started volleyball when I was six years old, so that sure helped me. But that doesn't mean we can't get better at them. 
And we have to get better at them, much better in the USA gym, and I think all of you would probably stand and wave car after car as they're driving across the border from te uh, into Texas, into, um, into northern the United States, from Canada, uh, from Mexico to California. And they all said, and it's kind of that 10,000 hours of deliberate practice you might have heard about to get to become an elite athlete, but they said it takes about eight, nine, ten thousand cars to go by, and then I start developing this perceptual expertise. And they don't even know what it is, but something is hinky, something's different. And after about ten thousand cars, they'll, something doesn't seem right in that car, and they pull them aside, and they're more often right than not that there's somebody illegal in the car, something illegal in the car, but it takes seeing this a lot to develop this sense of seeing hinky. You all have probably played the game a lot, I'm assuming, most of you. Most people don't coach unless they've played, although that's not impossible. But you've seen a lot more volleyball than your players, and so when the tip's coming out, you're thinking tip, 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 tip. <laughs> tip goes down and then the player moves. You've seen it more. You see the hinky. It's not because your eyes are better or my eyes are better. It's because you see the hinky earlier. Um, so here, back to, let's see, we've got a couple of serves here, just to finish up with this reading thing. And these are two straight serves from the same server in the Olympic semifinals, uh, Russia against the U.S. Russia had beaten the U.S. every time they played them in the whole quad until this match when the U.S. won 15-13. But here's a serve, and he pummels that thing pretty good. Loy Ball chooses to set the middle there. I'm not sure if that was the greatest decision. But then we have this serve, and it's an off speed, and he pulls uh, Riley Salmon to the ground. So there's a difference there. And if you're watching it, I'm, I actually pulled all, whoop, let's see, I pulled all these clips out, they're not super clear, but this is one way to see different things. So this is the first serve we saw. This is the hard jump spin serve. This is the soft jump spin serve. I looked at that. Uh, I've been watching the game a while. I picked out at least eight different things between one and the other. It's kind of like a Where's Waldo thing. So can somebody tell me some of the things that they see different in one versus the other? His left arm comes here. With yep, left arm's arm, different. The couple of things that I was noting are, A, the hand is here, and here the hand is down at his side. Also, the left arm is just generally more taut. There's more uh, muscle movement and more explosiveness <laughs> in this activity than this looser arm of this activity. I saw other hands up. Yes? can't tell from the stilt picture for sure, but I think the first one, there's much more shoulder rotation. The second one seems to be kind of close to the net, straight into the ball. Well, uh, he said there's one more, there's more shoulder rotation. And you're right, it isn't quite as easy to tell. These aren't super clear pictures, but I was just trying to pull stuff out. What you can see is that the ball is a little more in front of him here, and he's not looking up as much at the ball. Here, the ball is more above his shoulder and less in front of it, and his face is pointed up a little higher. Yes? Uh, his entire body posture is totally different. Body so posture is different. Rolling the ball forward as opposed to torquing the ball with his body. Yep, body posture is different here, straight here. Another thing I was noting is that the right knee is, is turned in, twisted in a little here. Kind of hard to see behind this player, but less so there. Um, another thing is the shoulder is dropped way down here, and here the shoulders are more even, somewhat related to the shoulder turn that you're talking about. Anything else? Foot position. <clears throat> Foot position, absolutely. This left leg, straight down. Here, the legs are about symmetrical. So if you're playing a volleyball contest and you see a server or a hitter, you don't need eight things. All you need is one. 
or two. And now you're going to have a jump on the ball. By the time he contacts the ball, you already know what's happening. It's going to take you a little while to actually move and do it, but, but by the time this happens, um, you should have a good sense of what's coming at you as a server coming at you, as an attacker coming at you. So this is a skill we need to teach our players a lot better and I think spend more time on that phase of the game because reading is such a valuable skill. Knowing what's going to happen earlier. It's not that we see better, it's that we get the right information a half second sooner and so now I can make the play. So as I go back in this, what I did was I took this as the base frame and then went backwards each time. And so here, back, oh, maybe five frames, the number almost disappears because of this assertive, aggressive turn. I'm coming at you. Here, not nearly as much turn. That's a great cue right there to help me know that an off-speed shot is probably coming. I'm going to make a better pass. Maybe I won't hit the ground. Maybe now I'll be able to make the play and still be a, a good attacker. Go back a few more. And, oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. Even here, you can see the left arm stayed really straight, like out that way, and he never quite got the same rotation, never got to here to get through, but it was more like here. That is a giveaway also. All we need is the one pattern to tell us more about the probability of what's going to happen. And it's not a certainty, but if we're playing the probabilities and we know and, and we file quickly through that visual encyclopedia, we're going to be better volleyball players. We're going to make our team better. Sure helps to have at least a couple of people a couple of people on your team with really good reading skills. So here that left arm's in front, on the left, on the right, the left arm never got there. Finally back to finish. Very different postures. So, finishing thoughts. If I serve at my players a lot off boxes versus have live servers, any difference? Every time I serve at a player of ours off a box, I deprive them of the rep of seeing what we just saw. Every time I hit at them standing on the ground on their side of the net or standing on a box on the opposite side of the net, I deprive them of this motion and of hitter in the air and hitter and ball meeting. Every rep in theory, should help them get to be better readers of the game. That's why we're not saying boxes are outlawed or are stupid. There's a place for a box. We have yet to find it in the USA gym in the last two years. We have not used a box once to, uh, to hit at any players. Uh, if we are going to hit at players, we're going to try and use live hitters, whether it's coaches hitting easy from the other side of the net or players. I think we've served at players a couple of times off the box just to have uh, a very fast flat serve coming at them and that the, the focus is not on the reading portion but just on facing really tough spin uh, tough float serves but just thinking about that every time we do something that's not game like we deprive them of an extra rep where they could maybe be getting to be better readers of the game we need all three. We need them to be able to read. We need to be able to be good mechanically. And then we can think more about the systems that we talked about. But if they don't read, if they don't have any clue what the ball's doing and it's crossing the net, it's going to be a tough way to make a living internationally. And I guess that was it. And I've gone over my time a little bit. Um, you guys are supposed to start seven minutes ago. All right, we'll just... And, uh, so whenever. Oh, okay. So we'll go a little longer. Question here. I, I noticed uh, the serve receive. I know. Yeah, at the Olympic level, it's all arms. But what about hand passing? Do you encourage that or not encourage that on the serve receive? Um, question was noticing a lot of players are doing forearm stuff. Um, how much should we think about this? 
you'll see it tonight when somebody knows they're, uh, like when number two for Ohio State is serving his standing float serve, you're going to see UCSB <laughs> players just going up and they're thinking all overhead. I think it's a good skill to learn. It's not my favorite rule change in history, but it is what it is, and we should take advantage of it. Figure out within the rules how to succeed. Generally, men are better than women. Boys are better than girls at this skill. I think women and girls can be good at this skill, but you don't see many of them. And well, that's something we want to develop further in the USA gym and at other levels. Yes, the men and boys are a little stronger if I get pushed to the back line to fling it up there, but that doesn't mean I can't be a girl or a woman and be good at this skill. One of the people who's really good at that skill, two of them in the USA gym, uh, Jordan Larson and Logan Tom, who happen to be our two starting outside hitters last year. Another dimension. So when I was playing, we couldn't do this. So we had to be good in a 360 degree arc. I never took the ball like this. This was total emergency. If it was coming, up here, I'm just going to put an angle here and get it to the spot, but it's going to be, it could be anywhere along here. Defensively, we had to do that too because we weren't allowed to play the ball overhead, even on a hard driven ball. That was only on the beach at that time. So we had to be good in a 360 degree circle, but now I should be good at this skill. I, we spend some, some time on it in the USA Women's Gym, specifically on getting better at that skill. I want to have we want to give our players more tools in their toolkit. The serve is the problem. What's the solution? We want to give them a lot of solutions to this, pro a lot of answers to this problem. This is another good answer. Yeah, just on that note, I'm, I'm coming from Canada, and this year they implemented a rule where 16 and under passing with the fingers is outlawed. And so they, they're sort of taking a step back. The, the reason for that, they've said, is internationally, we're, we're known as a fairly weak passing nation. And so they're trying to develop that, that forearm passing at, at earlier levels. Now, it's been met with mixed reviews this year, uh, especially for players who are used to this now, taking that away. And again, it's just 16 age, age 16 and, and, and younger, but uh, this is a point of interest there. Point of interest, in case you all didn't hear it, uh, in Canada, 16 and under, they have outlawed overhead passing uh, in order to develop their players' ability to forearm pass more successfully. It's a skill they feel like it'll serve them on the national team better. That's just, Did I just summarize? The or at higher levels. Yeah. Just, just the off the serve. Uh, pluses and minuses, I can think, to that. A lot, of, a lot of gray area. There's not a lot of black and white in volleyball, but a whole lot of gray. In the beginning, you talked about the passer that moved around a lot before she passed the ball. That's what they're teaching. Do you have any idea what the theory behind that these coaches are doing? Why? Uh, we saw that passer who took 24 steps and woo, and the ball still went to the spot. Uh, the question was any, any idea? It must be something that she's been taught. And any idea why they would teach that? And I'm guessing the idea is because I said so. Or the rationale is because I'm the coach and I said so. That's why we encourage, Nev and I were just talking about this yesterday. Players aren't always brave enough to do it, but we encourage them to do it. And I like Nev's strategy, actually. I'll tell it to you in a second. But we encourage players to ask why. We, we, we coaches should have the answer to that question. And it can't be because I said so. And it can't be because Karch said so. And it can't be because the USA team does it or because Brazil does it. There has to be a good reason that follows within your principles as to why. And I told you my buy-in as a player was better if there was some logic behind what Nev was telling me to do. So what he does in his gym is tell them something crazy and wrong at some point during the day. And he's hoping somebody will speak up and say, wait, why? What would be an example of something crazy you've told them? <laughs> uh, you think he did this on purpose? Yeah, yeah exactly. Surprise me. Well, I had two things. One is that I'd say something uh, to see if they were listening. So He'd say I'd, something to see if they were listening. Yeah, I mean, I'd uh, reference unlimited hydroplane racing. And actually, I can connect anything to volume. <laughs> the ultimate bridge builder. Yeah. And, but, um, yeah, I, I would, I, 
Yeah, so you could tell them, okay, you know, I think the best passing uh, angle, you're for sure going to make the best passing angle. I watched the, I watched the um, gold medalist Brazilian team doing this, and this is the new skill. And hopefully somebody's going to say, what, coach? What are you talking about? This is bizarre. There's got, what's the logic behind that? So we want our players to be asking why. And we, we should all have an answer to the why question. If we do, hopefully we've told it to them, but they don't always remember it the first or the third or the tenth time, but maybe on the twentieth. And when they keep hearing that, it gets in there, and that's part of the learning process. Yeah. Uh, when you talk to a lot of USA coaches that are coaching on international levels at younger ages, they talk about how the survey gets us there and how the other teams serve a lot harder. So going back to the USC thing, I mean, is their approach to the game correct? I mean, the execution wasn't there, but do we want people serving more aggressive in general, like on the junior levels, college levels? Good question. The question uh, was, um, 